Good afternoon uh, and welcome. Uh, delighted to see all of you here in Pepco Auditorium. A special welcome as well to everyone listening uh, live on Aspen Public Radio. Uh, a special thanks to Bonnie and Tom McCluskey for sponsoring this series. This is the first series of the summer. Uh, I'm Elliot Gerson of the Aspen Institute, and I'm absolutely delighted to have with us Professor Francis Fukuyama uh, of Stanford University, as you know, on the extraordinarily timely topics of populism, polarization, and national identity. Uh, Dr. Fukuyama will be signing his wonderful most recent book, Identity, the Demand for Dignity and the Politics of Resentment, immediately following in the lobby. Uh, three decades ago, Francis Fukuyama wrote an essay in a journal of relatively limited circulation that made him almost overnight a intellectual sensation, not just in the United States, but globally. That essay was called The End of History, and uh, I should note, and it's actually important, it was not a declaration, it ended with a question mark. And uh, uh, he described in that essay the triumph of Western-style liberal democracy as sort of the evolutionary direction of political ideology. Of course, fascism had been killed off in World War II, and communism uh, was presciently going to fall in the very year of that essay and in the years immediately following. But back to that question mark. Uh, as perhaps true of all essays that have that enormous impact, it has often been misunderstood by people as signaling that he was saying that history was actually ending, that virtual, virtuous liberal democracy would inevitably flourish everywhere and forever. But he did not mean end in that sense, or uh, he really meant it more of in a, in a Hegelian sense, that it was the target or objective of political history and that there could be threats or regression or even worse. And indeed, since that essay, and we'll talk mainly about this book in his books and his essays, articles, and lectures, he's focused on how political institutions could decay, uh, including in his book, The End of History and the Last Man, which was written just three years after that seminal essay, where he warned that while liberal democracy could deliver peace and prosperity, it might actually falter if it did not also deliver human dignity to everyone. And that's a theme that he returns to in this book. And then in his 2014 book, The Origins of Political Order, where he warned how political institutions in the United States were declining in the face of suffocatingly powerful political interest groups. And in this new book, which I hope you will enjoy reading, and I know you will enjoy listening to him about, Identity, the Demand for Dignity and the Politics of Resentment, he returns to the importance of dignity and how today, uh, instead of people securing their dignity in some universal shared sense of humanity, they tend to th seek it in some narrow sense of identity, be it ethnicity, nationality, gender, religion, or similar. And then he argues, and we'll talk about this, how that kind of narrow identity politics has been fanned and exploited by both the left and the right, imperiling liberal democracy, fueling the kind of populist nationalism we see everywhere, and leading to the kind of polarization that we're seeing not just here, but uh, all across the world. So let's start, if we can, uh, with this concept of dignity, and then we'll talk to, about some of these political issues. This, how long has dignity, as you describe it, been something that's been regarded as politically important? Is this a new concept of dignity? Uh, so, Elliot, before I answer that question, I want to thank you for that summary of my work. You did a much better job than I could have done in explaining the end of history, which, by the way, almost exactly 30 years ago, the, that essay was first published. Uh, so the question of dignity, I think, is an extremely old one. It's as old as political life. Uh, there is a term that is used by Plato, 
the Greek word that he uses is thumos. Thumos is usually translated into English as spiritedness or pride, but the idea behind it is that we all have this sense of our inner worth, and if we do not have that worth recognized by other people, we feel anger because we are disregarded, uh, disrespected. And this is something uh, Socrates lays out in Book Four of the Republic, and this was written 2,500 years ago, and I think it's been a central concept in politics uh, ever since. And it's something, by the way, that modern economists simply don't comprehend, because the economists say, well, we have these things called preferences or utilities. That's basically material desires, and we have reasons, so we use our reason to get stuff, to maximize the, the stuff that we get. But they don't understand that in addition to material goods, we sometimes want respect. We want other people to evaluate us positively. And in many cases, we're willing to give up material values in order to get that respect. And that, I think, is actually at the basis of a lot of politics, and it has been since Plato's time at least. But there were revolutions fought over dignity for a long time. For, many, for much of history, agrarian history, most people really didn't think about uh, any different identity than the one they had, their father, their mother, and generations before them. They lived in farming communities, and there wasn't much question about that. Uh, but then, flash forward, you start seeing things like the French Revolution and things more recently, which you argue were really, in some respect, fought about dignity. Well, to give a, <laughs> a very condensed history of the last 2,000 years, um, <laughs> You know, in aristocratic societies, not everybody has dignity. Only warriors have dignity because these are built around violence and the ability to do violence. Uh, I think this begins to change really in a way with Christianity because, you know, in the, in the Christian understanding, all human beings, qua human beings, are moral agents. They're capable of accepting God and therefore, in that respect, they're equal in God's eyes. And so you get a Christian universalism that all men are equal because of this ability to have human, uh, to have moral choice. And I think that this then takes on a secular form during the Enlightenment. Uh, thinkers like Immanuel Kant give a philosophical grounding so you don't have to be a Christian believer. And I think today, uh, if you th think about human rights, you know, a lot of uh, people believe that there are these things called universal human rights, among which is a right to respect for human dignity. It's written into the constitutions of many countries, South Africa, Germany, Japan, uh, and the like. And I think it comes from this understanding that in addition to our material selves, we are agents capable of making moral choices, and for that reason alone, we have to be treated with respect. As Kant says, we have to be treated as ends rather than simply means to another end. And, and that, that desire for respect and, and, and recognition of one's basic dignity, you argue, has been such an important f factor just in very recent history. You spend a lot of time, for example, in, the, in, 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 in talking about the Arab Spring and uh, Mohammed Bouazizi, I think his name was. W how, how does that relate to this issue? Well, dignity uh, really lies behind many political movements, including the movement for dignity. So, Mohammed Bouazizi was a Tunisian vegetable seller. He was part of the informal economy. Uh, one day, the police took his cart away. So, he goes to the governor's office. He says, where's my cart? Uh, and they don't give him an answer. They don't even talk to him. And as a result, he douses himself with gasoline, sets himself on fire. And that was the trigger for the Arab Spring because millions of people in the Arab world saw themselves in this individual. They were living in dictatorships that did not treat them with the minimal amount of respect. I mean, if, if you're treating a citizen with respect, at least you owe that citizen an answer. You know, why did my vegetable cart get confiscated? And he didn't get that, and, and that was the experience that was replicated by many people. So I think many democratic political movements are waged against authoritarian governments that do not treat their citizens with respect. In Ukraine, uh, a couple of years later, you had what the Ukrainians themselves called the revolution of dignity. Uh, 
their leader, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, was trying to drag Ukraine away from the European orbit into Vladimir Putin's kleptocratic, corrupt, uh, crony-based system. And they didn't want that because in that system, unless you're well-connected, you can't get ahead. You know, they wanted to be in a modern political system that respected their rights as, uh, as equal individuals. And that was the issue for them. And that's why they said that this struggle against Putinism is a struggle for our dignity. And then you draw a line to contemporary, well, not just contemporary, but over the last 50 years, movements in this country, for example, the civil rights movement, and then even much more recently, Black Lives Matter, Me Too. Is that part of that same continuum? So dignity takes many forms. In the United States, we have a declaration of independence that says all men are created equal. But we live in a society that does not actually treat uh, individuals with equal respect, even in cases where they're treated formally under the law uh, equally. Socially, there's discrimination, there's disrespect, there's disregard. And I think especially beginning in the 1960s, you had a big series of social movements, beginning with the civil rights movement for African Americans, but going through feminism, going through the LGBT movement, going through the uh, movements for the rights of the disabled, for indigenous peoples. Every single one of these groups had been marginalized by a mainstream American society that in the early 1960s was white, male, uh, probably you know Anglo-Protestant, and these groups felt uh, mistreated, uh, and they were mistreated. And so every one of them said, we want uh, the respect that's due to us as citizens of a country that has promised uh, equality of respect as one of the fundamental premises of our uh, democracy. And I think that, you know, that explains you know, the, the, the politics of uh, our country in the years since then. Well, we'll come back to how those really virtuous efforts to get dignity have actually been played out in a way that may now have unfortunate consequences for the state of our democracy. But let's just talk about the state of democracy. And you talk about this extensively in the book, too. Uh, until roughly the last decade, whether you look at the Freedom House statistics or many other things, it looked like democracy was on an ever-increasing uh, uh, ascent. More and more countries were, were democratic, uh, and democracy was thriving in the established democracies as well. But in the last decade, there seems to be a bit of a recession. Uh, fewer countries are democracies. Some democracies are becoming autocracies. And many democratic countries are beginning to show signs of autocratic tendencies. W what happened? So this is the real crisis we're in. We experience about a 40-year period, as you said, of what my mentor, uh, Samuel Huntington, labeled the third wave of democratization. So in the early 1970s, there were maybe 35 democracies in the world. By 2008, there were maybe 115, 120. So really big expansion, uh, punctuated by the fall of the Berlin Wall, which was the biggest expansion of freedom really in, in recent world history. But as you said, there's a lot of challenges right now. So some of them are very traditional in the sense that you have authoritarian powers like Russia and China. They're feeling very self-confident and very assertive and you're returning to a kind of geo-strategic game now, great power game. But I think the more uh, threatening uh, and unexpected development is something going on within liberal democracies themselves. Now, a liberal democracy is actually two different sets of institutions linked to each other. The democratic part has to do with voting, elections, uh, political accountability uh, by popular will. The liberal part has to do with a rule of law and a constitutional order that limits the power even if it's sanctioned by a democratic majority. And what we've been seeing repeatedly in many countries, in many democratic countries, is a party or a leader who is elected democratically but is using that democratic legitimacy to undermine the liberal part of liberal democracy by trying to uh, demolish the checks and balances that really go to make 
a true uh, liberal democracy. So this has happened in Turkey under President Erdogan. It's happened in Hungary under Prime Minister Orban. It's happened in Poland under the Law and Justice Party. Uh, and you know, there's other, uh, Italy elected a populist coalition last year. Brazil just elected a populist president, Jair Bolsonaro. And I hate to say it, the United States elected Donald Trump in uh, 2016. And I think that you know, we, we have much stronger institutions than most other democracies. So I think that the damage that's been done up to this point has actually been fairly limited, but in a way he fits this pattern you know, perfectly. Well, you even say in the book uh, that you would not have written this book if Trump had not been elected. And you point to the fact that not only was Trump elected, but you also see great global significance uh, about the Brexit vote that preceded that. So you really wouldn't have written this book if he hadn't been elected? <laughs> Well, I think that it was a very surprising phenomenon that someone like him could be elected in the United States. Um, you know, just to give you one example, uh, most, in fact, I would say every American president in my lifetime has made global democracy, you know, a cause, even if they were hypocritical in the actual pursuit of it uh, and did not like authoritarian or, or dictatorships. Trump has thrown that out the window. He really likes... Putin and Xi and Kim Jong-un. He seems to really dislike all of the democratic leaders that uh, he has to deal with. And so the moral valuation of the value of democracy itself has been turned on its head in a way that I really did not think I would see in American well, politics. you talk about what you thought you would see. I mentioned how your early essay was prescient in many respects, but I think I'm right. You actually mentioned Donald Trump. I did. In your book of how many years ago? 20-something 20, yeah. 20 years ago? What, what, what? Did you expect him to be president? Why did you give him a cameo appearance in that book? I was wrong about Donald Trump. <laughs> um, so in that book, so this was my book, The End of History and the Last Man, that came out in 1992. And in that book, uh, I said that one of the problems that a democracy has to deal with is this phenomenon of what I labeled megalothumia, meaning the desire to be recognized as superior to other people. In a democracy, for obvious reasons, that's a danger. But I said, democracies have ways of bleeding off that kind of energy. One of them is a capitalist economy, so that rather than becoming Caesar, you can become a billionaire, really rich, and make a lot of money. And that should satisfy the ambitions of would-be Caesars. And I gave Donald Trump as an example of this. And at that point, he was only a failed real estate developer. So little did I know that, you know, 25 years later, that wouldn't be enough for him, that he would also feel that he needed to go into politics, uh, uh, you know, to really satisfy that desire for superior recognition. So, and we'll, we'll, I want to talk about developments in other countries and then come back again to the United States, but just one question generally with this rise of populism. Um, why, and, and, and the election of, 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 of President Trump, why did the parties of the left and center left parties, not just here but everywhere, take up the cause of these individual marginalized groups rather than a broad group of those economically disadvantaged? Uh, because it seems like in your thesis that that choice of the left parties to define their constituencies in these narrow verticals as opposed to across mm -hmm. the spectrum of those economically disadvantaged has really been a major cause of the problems you see today. So that uh, is, is an important background condition for the rise of populism. Uh, beginning at the same time that you saw the rise of these um, social movements, which, to repeat, I think were based on a demand for social justice that was completely legitimate, you had this redefinition of inequality on the part of a lot of left-wing parties. In the 20th century, they were defined around social class, meaning the working class and their trade unions. And so every major left-wing party, whether communist or social democratic saw uh, 
the working class, the proletariat as their chief constituency. Uh, and in every country at that time, the proletariat was the dominant ethnicity in that country, meaning in this country, they were white people, they were white working class people. But with the rise of these social movements, there was a slow change in the understanding of inequality and marginalization away from that economic understanding to the specific ways in which groups experienced uh, injustice. And, and you know, it's understandable, right? The way that a black woman uh, or a gay uh, you know, man living in Texas experiences discrimination, they're simply different, right? So there's a logic behind this. But I think that one of the problems is that under this redefinition, uh, increasingly the parties of the left began to lose touch with that working class base, you know, the white working class base that had formerly been their single biggest constituency. In the United States, in the 1936 election, you know, something like 80 to 90 percent of the white voters in the South voted for Franklin Roosevelt, voted for the left-wing party because he was bringing them the TVA and a lot of social programs that were actually helping them out. Uh, but, you know, that um, white working class voter in the Democratic Party, beginning sometime in the late, in the, in, you know, in the Reagan years, uh, began shifting to the Republican Party. That is exactly why Donald Trump got elected, because in three states, in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, enough working class voters defected. They had voted Democratic in the previous election, which put Obama in office, but they defected to Trump, and that is what put him uh, into the White House. This has been happening all over the, uh, the developed world. So in Europe, uh, left-wing parties have been in decline. The German Social Democrats today get 20% fewer votes than they did you know, 20 years ago. The French Socialist Party has basically disappeared. Let's just stay in Europe again for a minute. We'll come back to the United States. We mentioned Brexit very briefly. I mean, Brexit also, you know, seems in some respects to make no sense economically um, and is driven by a sense of, of nostalgia for an imagined great past. Are there, what are the similarities that you see between the Brexit phenomenon and, and the Trump election? So I think there are a lot of similarities. The, uh, first of all, the sociology is almost identical. Uh, the way that you can predict a populist voter is really the inverse of population density. So if you live in a big city that's well connected to the global economy with lots of educated people, lots of job opportunities, they're going to vote for the liberal order. Uh, they're not going to vote for the populist and vice versa. And that's exactly what happened in Britain. Greater London voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union and was the smaller cities and rural areas that supported the vote. I don't, you know, I think if you think about dignity and thumos, it's not so hard to explain. The thing that I think the, the Leave voters held against the European Union. You know, they don't like Brussels bureaucrats telling them how to label their cheese and, and things like that, but the real thing was immigration. Uh, and there's been a huge amount of cultural change in Britain. Uh, this is a little remark statistic, but in one 18-month period, 800,000 Poles moved from Poland to Britain in the last five years. So this is a country of 60 million people, and if almost a million people from one country move there in that short a period of time. That's a lot of change. Uh, and this was happening across the board. And so I think the uh, Leave voters said, you know, our country is being overrun by foreigners. We don't seem to be able to do anything about it because we're members of this damn thing called the European Union that doesn't allow us to control our own borders. And that's why we want to vote uh, to get out. So that rural-urban divide, you say it's global. I mean, you mentioned Erdogan in, in Turkey. I mean, Istanbul and, and Ankara, you know, are not supportive of him. Of him. And, and, and you look at Paris and the countryside. So is, is, it, is it just that the advantages of globalization have gone primarily to urban areas? And also, ironically, this, this fear of the other or of immigrants is primarily in areas 
where there are relatively few immigrants and relatively few others, and we see that in the United States too. Yeah, no, it's a fascinating social change that's happening across the world where uh, agglomerations of educated people are taking home the vast majority of the economic rewards that our modern world provides, and the richer they get, the bigger these, these metropolitan areas get, and it means that everybody else is left behind. So there is definitely an economic component to this, but there's also a cultural component because it is these big, urban, sophisticated, well-educated areas that produce culture. You know, that's Hollywood. That's the media centers of New York and Washington uh, in the U.S. And I think that people that don't live in these big cities that are less educated, uh, you know, live in less densely populated areas with less economic dynamism feel correctly, I would say, that people that do live in these cosmopolitan areas look down on them culturally, you know, as being less educated. I mean, you know, so in the, in the Brexit debate, you had all these uh, Remain spokesmen that said, you know, what's wrong with you people? Didn't you take a basic economics course? Don't you know that this is really bad for the British economy? And I think the Leave voter would say in return, yeah, well, I don't care. You know, if this is what it takes to keep these foreigners out, I'm going to accept that. And in any case, who the hell are you to be speaking to me this way? You know, you and your arrogant uh, yeah, well, elitist. The recent uh, polls in Britain show that even when people are told that the economy will be far worse off, they don't care. Yeah. Well, but that's <laughs> dignity politics. You know, that's the politics of identity trumping economic self-interest. And I think... I mean, dignity, can it affect, uh, uh, it explain some other phenomenon unrelated to some of the ones we've been talking about? For example, she in China talks about a hundred years of humiliation. So in a sense, that sense of lack of dignity, lack of respect for China over the last hundred years is partially perhaps fueling his support and enthusiasm. I think if you scratch the surface of almost any major political phenomenon, you will find an element of dignity politics involved. So as you say, uh, the rise of modern China is all about China reacquiring uh, the, the Middle Kingdom status that it once enjoyed without any question. Uh, China, if you look at its long history, was the center of the universe. And it did undergo this 100-year period of Western colonialism where it fell apart, it became one of the most impoverished countries in the world, it became synonymous with poverty in the early 20th century, and now they feel we're back, but countries like the United States don't want to accept that. You know, they, they want to continue to see us as poor and weak and impoverished, and we don't like that. Russia, you know, so I'm, I'm no friend of Vladimir Putin, but, you know, I don't think it's that hard to see that you know, you're the former Soviet Union, you're a nuclear power, you're the second big great power in a, in a bipolar world, and all of a sudden in the 1990s, your country falls apart. You know, a, a third of the country simply leaves as independent nations, you're left with this rump Russia that is now the award of the IMF and, uh, you know, begging for handouts from Western countries. It's a huge loss of status, and I think what Putin is all about is regaining that status and regaining a self-respect. The trouble is that for many countries, and I think both Russia, but Russia more than China, can't respect itself unless it dominates other countries. And that's really the problem. And, and, and Putin is using Russia's relatively limited resources to exploit the very divisions that you're talking about. And one way he's doing that is with social media. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how social media is exacerbating, if it is, all of the trends that you're talking about. Well, you said it. I think that social media is almost perfectly designed to facilitate identity politics. Uh, so you want to identify with the small group that is like you in terms of your preferences. And social media allows you to be in touch with them no matter what continent they live on. So incels or, uh, you know, people that believe uh, that, um, you know, Hillary Clinton is behind a sex ring out of a pizza parlor in Northwest Washington, you know, in any given 
town, there are not more than one or two people like that, but on the internet, there's, there's thousands of them, and they can reinforce each other, and they can spread uh, you know, very outlandish conspiracy theories because the internet has removed all of the fact checkers and editors and you know, filters that used to exist in uh, traditional media. So I want to get, before we turn things over to the audience, uh, to some, some, some s sources, perhaps, of optimism and things we can do. Uh, <laughs> please, please. Um, um, but um, w just practically speaking, given the situation we're in, what, for example, do we do? And there are other countries with comparable situations. There are, what, 10 or 11 or 12 million undocumented people in the United States. And they are a key factor in the appeal of, of nationalist populism. What, what do we do about that? As a policy matter, I think there is a straightforward solution to this that has been staring us in the face. And it's a, it's a consequence of our dysfunctional political system that we've not been able to implement this. You basically do this trade that was, uh, it, it, it was embodied in the attempted legislation under George W. Bush, where you give those 12 million undocumented uh, immigrants a path to citizenship, an eventual path to citizenship, in return for real enforcement of existing citizenship laws in the future. Uh, that's been a trade-off that I think is politically the only possible way of solving our immigration problem. The reason that you can't get there is that our system privileges well-organized interest groups. And on both the left and the right, uh, there are groups that are absolutely against you know, what on the right is called amnesty, and on the left is basically um, border enforcement. Uh, and as a result of that, we can't get this deal that should logically be the way forward on, on you know, this particular issue. Well, let's, one of the other things you talk about, and this gets back to what we need to do about our problems, is you know, identity politics, in a sense, they're inevitable. And it, you also talk about how important it is for there be, to be national identity. One of the problems in Europe today is there really is not a European identity um, but we don't have enough of an American identity today. And you point to Sir Syria as an example at the extreme of what happens when there is not a national identity. So in the United States context, um, you know, you say that the movements for the marginalized, whether it's Black Lives Matter or LGBTQ rights or, or, or gender rights generally, or, or you know, civil rights, disability rights. These are all important movements that you agree with. But you also seem to argue that celebrating diversity isn't enough to create a national identity. Could you just expand on that a no, bit? No, so that's absolutely right. I think that you can pursue and you should be pursuing all of these social justice issues. You know, police violence is a big problem in a number of important American cities. So you, you need to solve that. Uh, sexual harassment is a big problem in workplaces, right? So you need to solve that. But you also need uh, a democratic uh, national identity. And what that means is a set of values that Americans, as American citizens, hold in common. Uh, and I think that one of the great advantages of the United States is that it's one of the few democracies that by the end of the civil rights era had worked its way to what I call a civic uh, national identity, meaning it was an identity based around belief in the Constitution, belief in the rule of law, belief in the principle of equality um, enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. And what it meant to be an American was to believe in those principles. And, you know, and it's, it's something I mean, if you want an illustration, if, I don't know how many of you have attended a naturalization ceremony in the United States. In Europe, they're not ceremonies. I mean, it's just a bureaucratic procedure. You go to an office, you get a piece of paper. In the United States, it's a big deal. You take the oath of naturalization, you have all these people from different countries, and at the end of it, you swear allegiance to the United States, and you can say, I'm an American. 
And nobody is going to laugh at you for that, whether you come from Korea or Guatemala or Iran or wherever, because as we've defined Americanness over time, it does not have a racial meaning, it does not have a religious meaning, it has a civic meaning based on certain you know, democratic political principles that underlie our constitutional form of uh, government. And unfortunately, I think that because of the emphasis on you know, these smaller identities, we've lost sight of the need to, in addition, have these integrative types of identities that you know, bind us together. And the result is you know, political polarization, where we cannot agree you know, even on that basic historical narrative uh, that we ought to teach our school, you know, school children as to what does it mean to be uh, uh, an American. And that's, I think, part of what we need to recover. Uh, that's what I think we need some political leadership for. I, I think it has even more moral power when you say something like that. I think you had some near relatives who were in internment camps, mm -hmm. and yet you were such a passionate advocate of common identity for Americans. Yeah, so that's right. I mean, my grandfather lost his business in Little Tokyo in Los Angeles because he had to go off to an internment camp, and a lot of my relatives spent the war uh, there. But, you know, that did not, um, you know, that's something that the United States officially apologized for. It paid a restitution, and I think that the opportunities that, you know, my family had overall uh, far outweighed, you know, that particular uh, injustice. And so this is the thing about this American narrative. You know, we don't want to teach American history that glosses over all these bad things. You know, we don't want to deny the reality of slavery, of Jim Crow, of continuing discrimination based on race or ethnicity or religion. Um, but it does seem to me that we can also tell a progressive story which has unfolded in my lifetime, right? I was born in 1952 and you had you know, official segregation in the United States. Even in Washington, D.C., where I lived for 20 years, black people could not walk on a lot of streets in downtown Washington because it was a segregated city uh, when I was growing up. And we've gone past that. So you know, I think this is the kind of narrative that we really need to spin out and work on a little bit harder uh, to give us a sense that we you know, have had a lot of problems and a lot of injustice in the past, but, you know, these are something that as Americans we really need to, you know, to work on and, and, and make progress on. Well, I, as, as, uh, as a first-generation American born in the same year, I couldn't agree with you more about these things. Uh, what, I, I said some things we could do about this. Um, one thing in your book you talk about, which actually had an important, uh, 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 episode here at the Aspen Institute is national service. Uh, you know, a few hundred yards from here, a few years ago, General Stanley McChrystal spoke about the importance of national service, if not military service, civilian service, as something that could create a common experience across zip codes, nationalities, ethnicities, race, uh, to bring young people together in common activity. And, and is, is that something? And that, until this president, had been a bipartisan goal. Do you think that could make a real difference? Well, I'm all in favor of national service. Um, I think that, you know, as a society, we become incredibly compartmentalized and segregated. And I don't mean that just in racial terms. I think in class terms. Uh, if you live in one of these bubble communities like I do, Palo Alto, California, you never see a working class person unless you need some work done on your kitchen, right? Uh, and there's many divides like that uh, that have to do with region, that have to do with ethnicity, race, uh, and social class. And I think one of the great things that you see in the actual US military, you know, that's one of, you know, as many people said, that's one of the few American institutions where a black man can boss around a white man, you know, and does it, you know, and they do this pretty regularly. Uh, where you have this kind of mixing of social classes and regions uh, and so forth. Now, we're obviously, we don't want, I think, to bring back the draft, although it's something to consider. We probably would get involved in fewer wars if everybody sent their children into the military, but I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I do think civilian service, though, is something that 
you know, would have potentially that kind of beneficial uh, effect of putting different people together in a common, you know, struggle. What about the role of public education as a possible engine to help advance this creedal sense of what it means to be American? Well, look, I'm in favor of civic education. Uh, there's all this poll data on how little American high school students know about their own country. They can't name a single right in the Bill of Rights. They can't name the three branches of government, you know, this sort of thing. So that's obviously bad. Uh, the problem is that our degree of polarization, I think, right now is such that if you said, well, let's correct that by having better civic education, I don't think we could agree on the narrative right now that we're going to teach our children um, because we've got very, very different narratives. I'll just see what happens with the Texas school book controversies. Yeah. What about, uh, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. We'll have 15 or so minutes left. Maybe. Uh, what about um, the English language? Um, bilingual education, multilingual education. What do you feel about that? Well, I'm skeptical that it's actually helping. Um, it, it's complicated because if you live in a society where you have a linguistic minority that's been living in the same region for generations, uh, to impose a single national language on them uh, is actually not a good idea. Uh, uh, on the other hand, in the United States, because we have such a long history of immigration and people learning to speak English as part of their process of cultural assimilation, uh, I think that that's you know, not uh, an unreasonable demand. My father, so my grandfather came from Japan in 1905. He did not speak English terribly well. My father grew up speaking English the way I do in the Los Angeles public school system. And in that era, they made no concessions whatsoever to multiculturalism or bilingualism or multilingualism. And he always, to the end of his life, thought that was the greatest thing that was ever done for him. He went on to get a PhD at the University of Chicago. He became a university professor, you know, because he spoke English like, you know, other Americans. And so, you know, so my personal family experience, you know, tells me that if you can do that, it's probably a good thing because that's really the basis of a common culture is being able to communicate. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to open it up now, and we need to wait for microphones because I remember. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm going to need help from the people with the microphones, but I think there's someone right on the aisle here. I, I've thought for a long time that one of the problems we've had in this country is we do no longer have, and haven't had for about 30 years, a, a viable external enemy to hate. <laughs> and so what we've done is taken a human inclination to hate others and turned on each other. And I'd like you to comment on that, and if that's the case, this is a big problem. <laughs> uh, so it's true that common enemies oftentimes increase the degree of national unity uh, and national identity, uh, but that's not a good formula uh, <laughs> for promoting national identity uh, because you know that uh, dislike of the other oftentimes turns into actual aggression and conflict. Uh, and I don't think it's necessary. I think you can build national identity based on a lot of other things. I mean, you know, Australia, Canada, I mean, there's lots of countries that have national identities that are democratic and meaningful, and they don't have enemies, you know? Um, I mean, Canadians have problems with Americans, but I don't think they, I mean, it, it's actually, that's a little bit complicated because in a way, Canadian identity is sort of built around not being American, but, <laughs> It's, it's, it's in a more positive sense that we're better than Americans, um, uh, but not you know, in, in the kind of aggressive way of, you know, you're our enemy. So I, I think that's you know, probably not the route to take. Do we have a question over here? I, I can't. Uh... Thank you. Um, I have a good friend who voted for Trump, 
adheres to Trump. He's a retired New Hampshire state trooper. And in trying to explain this to me, he said, if you're not black or gay or a refugee, they don't care about you anymore. He was speaking specifically of his very mainstream white Protestant church parish, but I think the they was actually a bigger group than that. How can a person, how can people like us who probably don't feel that way do anything to address that man's problem? Well, first of all, <laughs> I think you got to start by getting it out of your mind that he's the one that's got this problem and you somehow have to fix this. Uh, because, quite frankly, I think that there is something to that narrative in terms of the kind of cultural disrespect that a lot of people in his situation feel. Now, it may not be that actually, you know, refugees and immigrants and, and you know, um, African Americans are pushing him aside, but it is the case that the white working class in the United States has gone through a, a, a breathtaking social decline and I think the elites in this country did not pay attention while that was happening. This was the result of the broad deindustrialization that was taking place throughout the Rust Belt and the manufacturing centers, you know, uh, in the uh, Midwest of the United States over the past uh, 30 years. Uh, and it's led to remarkable statistics, you know, drops of income where uh, people are, especially white male working class people are earning less than their grandfathers were uh, in real terms. There's also a gender component to this because in many of these households, the man is no longer the chief breadwinner, it's, it's, a, uh, you know, it's a woman. Uh, there's an opioid epidemic, so I think now we're all aware of that, but in the last year for which the CDC has numbers, something like more than 70,000 Americans died of opioid um, related uh, overdoses. That's more than the total number of traffic accident deaths in the United States. And a lot of this was going on under our noses. Uh, and I think it really took the 2016 election. You know, I, I remember actually the first confrontation with this was in the New Hampshire primary where it turned out the single biggest issue for New Hampshire voters was this drug epidemic. You know, who would have thought at that point? I mean. I, living in Palo Alto, California, I was not aware of this fact, right? And so I think that, you know, there is something to this feeling that the elites, you know, educated people that live in big, bustling, cosmopolitan cities really did not care about this particular group of people, you know, this older working class. Certainly the two political parties, the media, you know, the elites in this country didn't pay attention. I think they're trying to pay a little bit better attention now. Uh, and I think the first thing that we can do if we want to heal some of this divide is to actually listen sympathetically to what they're saying and you know, not simply think that this is a misguided, you know, I mean, the worst version of it is to say, well, these people are just racists and bigots and so forth, um, because they actually do have, you know, there's, there's a core to what they're saying that actually reflects a certain reality. And, and dignity. <laughs> yeah. uh, Marty, right here. Uh, wait for the microphone, please. Uh, can you say something about uh, the growing weakness of international institutions as a result of this great emphasis on nationalism all over the country, all over the world? I mean, we have the European Union, which you briefly mentioned, but we have the Paris Accord, which the United States left, uh, the Pacific partnership with the United States left, and uh, even the Iran uh, nuclear pact, which had lots of allies uh, attached to it. Yeah, well, you said it. <laughs> you know, uh, I think that's bad. I think that we need more international cooperation. Um, you know, one of the consequences of globalization is we have a lot of co uh, problems that no one nation can solve, so you need this kind of cooperation. And the United States, you know, under this administration has been leading the way out of uh, all of them. Uh, and that's bad. And I think, you know, that should be, uh, that should be reversed. Um, I think that, 
In Europe, uh, you have a similar phenomenon where the European Union is seen as the source of a lot of problems that are really not, you know, where it's really not to blame. Um, and so I think there is a, you know, another example of an international institution that's actually worked pretty well that's unfairly getting blamed. Now, I should, maybe this is a good time to make this general point. So you were, you were asking about points of optimism and everybody laughed. I actually do think that there are some points of optimism. Uh, for example, as a result of Brexit, I don't think there's a single country in the EU today that's thinking of leaving. Uh, given what a big disaster it looks like it's, it's produced in the United Kingdom. Uh, and I think for democracy around the world, there's a lot of hopeful signs. And so you've had an uprising in Algeria, in Sudan. Uh, you have a new leader in Ethiopia that's turned an authoritarian system into a much more uh, open one. Uh, you have pushback in Turkey. So Erdogan uh, lost this big vote in, in Istanbul. Uh, to a more, you know, democratic kind of opposition. What about the protests in Hong Kong? Pro protests in Hong Kong that forced that government at least temporarily to back down. So I think the impulse, you know, there is a, people don't like living under these authoritarian governments and uh, they're mobilizing, you know, to push back against it. Where they haven't been so successful is creating viable institutional alternatives to them. You know, successful democracies that deal with corruption and poor service delivery and all this sort of thing. And that's really the agenda that I think a lot of us have to face. But basically, you know, a lot of this is going to be decided at the ballot box, uh, just as it was in Istanbul. Up here. Question to go, go back to optimism, back to the Palo Alto bubble. In the students that you see every day, a very cross-section of presumably very bright students, do you, do you have reason to be optimistic? Are there good ideas coming from these, from the kids that you see every day? Or, or are they totally overwhelmed by what's, what's happening around them? Um, well, it's uh, very difficult to generalize. Uh, I think that there's certainly a higher degree of student activism today than there was, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, and in some respects, that's a really good thing because students shouldn't just be, you know, careerist and not caring about public issues and, you know, things happening in the world around them. Um, the kinds of things that they mobilize over uh, are sometimes, you know, really excellent, you know, world hunger and, you know, um, uh, human trafficking and, you know, lots of issues like that. Some of them, I think, are a little bit short-sighted. Uh, I just find it very hard to, you know, make any generalizations because I do think that there is a tendency in our media world to act, make generalizations by anecdote, right? So, um, you know, for example, Charles Murray uh, was involved in this really nasty incident at Middlebury College where he was physically attacked, you know, for simply daring to speak there. And so this goes around in the conservative media as a, you know, free speech is dead on the American campus uh, case. Well, so Charles Murray came to Stanford last winter. I debated him. Uh, we had a very polite conversation. There was a little protest, but not enough to shut the thing down. He said, you know, after Middlebury, he probably spoke at 50 different campuses around the country. And so I think, you know, freedom of speech is actually still alive and kicking. I think we have right question here. I can't see. Ah, over on this side. Can you speak about Muslim immigration? We see in Europe where there are no-go zones and a lot of pushback back against them. Can you talk about that in the United States? And also this, the clergy who many times speaks ugly terms in ugly well, terms. Well, so the problem First of all, I think we should be very clear, the problem is not with Islam, right? Islam, just like any other large religious system, is subject to lots of different forms of interpretation, and many of them are quite liberal, right? So in many parts, in many Muslim countries, you know, they're good democracies, uh, you know, there's not a kind of intolerant form of 
religion practiced. The real problem, uh, I think, has been Saudi Arabia because after 1979, when the Grand Mosque was attacked, they tried to protect their own legitimacy by putting a lot of money into the propagation of an extremely conservative, in fact, reactionary version of Islam known as Wahhabism or Salafism. And so they funded a lot of madrasas all over the world. And if you trace the origins of a lot of the radical Islamists, you know, that's where it comes from. So our friends, the Saudis, are really the ones that are, are, are doing this sort of thing. Uh, I think that that is a problem that actually could be controlled quite easily because it is really not the practice of a lot of the, you know, a majority of the uh, Muslim communities, you know, around the world. But in Europe, it is a, you know, a much bigger problem than here because, you know, there are immigrant communities that essentially don't want to assimilate down the road. I think in this country, that's not true of virtually any uh, immigrant community. You know, they, they ultimately want assimilation in the second or third generation. But there's definitely a significant, you know, population of European Muslims that don't have that as a goal. And how you deal with that, I think, is going to be one of the biggest challenges for European uh, democracies. One of the problems is, you know, it is a political correctness problem because uh, a lot of people really don't want to talk about this. And if you don't talk about it, you can't come up with solutions and sort of have an honest conversation about the extent of the problem and you know, what possible solutions, you know, might exist. Do we have a last question? A woman right in the middle here. Um, can you speak um, about the rise of populism causing the rise of anti-Semitism? Um, you know, traditionally, the two of them were very closely linked. Um, that was certainly the case for the populist movements in, you know, the 1930s and so forth. And it's certainly the case that you see lots of anti-Semitism among alt-right, you know, white nationalist types in the United States. But it's, you know, we're living in a much more complex world in which the two, in many cases, have become detached from one another. So, for example, uh, Heert Wilders in the, in the Netherlands, who runs the VVD, which is their big populist party, loves Israel, you know? Uh, Israel is, you know, for him, I mean, it's this, it's this funny thing that he's so anti-Muslim <laughs> that he likes the Israelis because they're anti-Muslim, or in his view, they're, they're anti-Muslim. And so it produces some, you know, very strange bedfellows. Um, I think that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has become a populist. He didn't start out this way, but you know, Israeli identity has been shifting from, you know, this older liberal one uh, that was, you know, in many respects trying to be an, you know, uh, Israel as a, as a European liberal democracy to one in which Jewish identity has become much more uh, central. And, you know, he's using a lot of the similar kinds of mobilization techniques that other populist leaders is. And he loves Donald Trump, you know, and he loves, he actually gets along with Putin and with, you know, a lot of other European populists. And so it's, it's a complicated world we're living in. You know, I think that there's not a simple correlation, like all bad people don't necessarily believe the same thing. <laughs> well, we do need to end on time. This has been a great privilege for all of us. We could listen to you for a long time. Thank you very much.